What the Second World War did for the global asbestos industry is kind of like what steroids did for Arnold Schwarzenegger. It made it powerful and humongous. Along with the standard use in uniforms and firefighting equipment, asbestos was added to more and more wartime technology to make it stronger and more resistant to the dangers of fire. Even Winston Churchill had his war rooms and bunker under Downing Street fortified with asbestos cement, and instead of fire extinguishers, he had asbestos napkin and blanket dispensers throughout, including one right above his bread box, to guard against the dangers of fire and fire bombs. The Canadian asbestos industry was so vital to the Allied forces that even before it joined the war, the United States had plans to invade Quebec if its asbestos mines were taken by Germany. asbestos miners were actually declared heroes for not enlisting in the armed forces, and their work in the mine was seen as fundamental to Allied victory. This gave the people of asbestos a great deal of pride in themselves and their land. Before the war, in order to meet demand, Johns Manville radically enlarged the Jeffrey Mine, destroying the original neighborhoods of the town and earning it the local nickname La Mine qui gugnot le village, or the mine that nibbled on the village. Despite this, the war helped asbestos become a town that looked to the future, not the past, as lovely asbestos beauties worked in the first asbestos manufacturing plant in Canada, and shifts were run 24 hours a day. shadow the deteriorating health of the people of asbestos. Although the first reported asbestos-related death in Britain was in 1924, nobody in Canada really officially died because of the mineral until the 1970s. Secret reports were passed among company officials, but as long as Johns Manville provided top-notch medical care in asbestos, nobody was told why they were getting sick. Instead, they were transferred to less dusty parts of the operations, or told they were sick because they smelled. also helped establish McGill University's Department of Industrial Hygiene on the condition that the company could edit any medical reports written on asbestos workers. What could be worse than that? Well, how about the fact that Johns Manville also had a company lawyer, later a conservative candidate for the Canadian government, Ivan Saborin, smuggle secretly autopsied lungs of deceased asbestos miners across international borders from Quebec to a lab just outside of Plattsburgh, New York, so the company could know what was happening to them, i.e. cancer, but the workers would not. workers weren't told about their illnesses or the cause of them, but this did not mean that they were ignorant of what was happening to their own bodies. The diseases asbestos causes are not subtle, and while they do have symptoms similar to other diseases, they are unique in their manifestations. The story of the town of asbestos is a story of give and take, of negotiation and risk. The first and only time the workers in asbestos went on strike for better health standards at the Jeffrey Mine was for five months in 1949, following the publication of an expose on asbestos written by Burton Ledoux showing how the mineral acts like a spider's web spinning tighter and tighter around your lungs until you suffocate to death. Pretty scary stuff. Ledoux compared the conditions Quebec asbestos miners worked in to those European Jews experienced in concentration camps, which was extremely inflammatory language following the war.
strike shut down the Canadian asbestos industry and strangled the global supply of the mineral, as Quebec provided over 60% of the $64 million industry. Canada wasn't the only or the cheapest country in the world that mined asbestos, but it was the friendliest. Its main competitors were the Soviet Union and the southern half of Africa. As Stalin was dying and the Cold War was heating up, Soviet asbestos, which is similar to Canadian, was not a viable option for much of the Western asbestos-hungry world. Although the fibers were still light, they were tainted communist red. asbestos was even more problematic than Soviet. Because of its geological origin, South African asbestos consists of long, blue, wool-like fibers that make it perfect for weaving. But the chemical makeup is slightly different from Canadian, leading some to say that it's actually much more toxic than its Canadian counterpart. Although, the people who say this are usually pro-asbestos lobbyists, or the Canadian Medical Association, or the Canadian Cancer Society for much of their history although they may be loath to admit to such a thing now. Companies and countries looking for alternative suppliers of asbestos were at a loss. Canada was the best option. What's more, when the 1949 strike was finally settled, no acknowledgement of any health risks associated with the industry were given, showing us the real power these companies had. Although they were competitors, companies like Johns Manville and Turner and Newell belonged to an asbestos league of nations, and they worked together to cover up the negative health effects of the mineral, even as they were learning it also caused lung cancer and mesothelioma, a particularly aggressive cancer of the linings of major organs like hearts and lungs. This was a united front, and they employed a convenient scapegoat when the industry was criticized. Oh no, it wasn't Canadian asbestos that made people sick, it was South African. Not only were some of the fibers different in chemical makeup and length, which obviously makes it suspicious, asbestos from the dark continent, even if it was the same type as found in Quebec, was anything but white. The national smear campaign against African asbestos was incredibly successful and it brought the Canadian asbestos industry time. Now found in everything from theater curtains, oven mitts, floor tiles and car parts, Quebec asbestos was experiencing its glory days. But the global nature of the industry meant that just as the 1960s were beginning, the glory days of asbestos were ending. Mm -hmm. 